All right, it is eight o'clock. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, I know for a fact we've got more than just our region on today. I see lots of lots of faces that we only get to see sometimes. So welcome to both regions, everybody who's here. Uh, we appreciate you uh, taking the time during this training week to do this. It feels like this is a glorious, cli uh, you know, climatic event from um, violence in the 19th century to polygamy to, to today. We get to uh, um, hear from Brother Paul Reeve uh, regarding race and the priesthood and the things that he has prepared for that. Um, if we could get started with a prayer. Um, Brad Turner, do you mind saying a prayer for us to get us started? Dear kind, loving Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Heavenly Father, for this time that we have to be together as a region and area family. Father, we love thee, and we are thankful for preparation of Brother Jesus put into presentation. We're thankful for uh, truth and Oh, Father, but we just ask that our hearts are be open that we may be able to learn and to receive witness and confirmation from the Spirit, Father of Truth, that we may be able to reach our youth and be able to better serve thine children, Father. We we love thee and we say these things in thine Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brad. Um, so for those who are maybe joining us for the first time, we're, we're kind of been following a bit of a pattern, uh, giving the bulk of our time uh, to Brother Reeve to to share with us his scholarship and his and his faithfulness. Um, uh, after he is done, we'll enter a kind of a Q&A stage, at which point we'll encourage you to use the chat feature um, to to put down any of the questions that you have. Um, whether you want to do that during his uh, his presentation as kind of questions come, but just know that sometimes he answers those questions as you go. Um, members of the uh, Gilbert Arizona Training Council will kind of will, will sift through those questions and ask them um, as as we can, just so that we can kind of channel everything to one spot and we don't have to worry about people trying to talk over each other. So please use the chat feature for your questions. Um, so introduction to our our, pre our presenter today um uh brother w paul reeve is a is the simmons chair of mormon studies in the history department at the university of utah where he teaches courses on utah history mormon history and the history of the u.s west his book religion of a different color race and the mormon struggle for whiteness received three best book awards He's the recipient of the Utah Council for the Social Studies University Teacher of the Year Award, the University of Utah's Early Career Teaching Award, and the College and the College of Humanities Ramona W. Cannon Award for Teaching Excellence in the Humanities. He's the project manager and general editor of a digital database, Century of Black Mormons, designed to identify all known Black Latter-day Saints baptized into the faith between 1830 and 1930. And the database is now live on centuryofblackmormons.org. Um, with that, we'll turn the time over to Brother Reeve. And uh, we really appreciate you taking out time in this summertime to, to be with us. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, um, Brother Anderson. It's, it's an honor to be with you um, and to share with you some of, some of my research. Um, my hat's off to all of you. Uh, two of my daughters graduated from seminary uh, this year. Um, they're the fourth of my children to graduate from seminary. Um, so I appreciate your efforts uh, uh, teaching, um, you know, the right generation. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful to just share with you some of the things that I've learned uh, in this topic over the last decade. Um, so... Let me just uh, share with you lessons from the archives, um, things that I have picked up uh, that I think are helpful for us to understand uh, the Latter-day Saint racial story. Um, 
And I wanted to start with maybe a bit of a broader American context. Uh, for me, I think it's helpful to think about um, the Latter-day Saint racial story. And a lot of times we talk about, you know, um, black and brown as if that's what, um, you know, the American racial problem has been. In my estimation, uh, the racial problem is whiteness. Uh, and I, I think we need to understand the power of whiteness in um, a very fraught American racial context. Um, let me just give you a couple of examples. And I've just picked out some data points as illustrations. There are a lot more things uh, that we could talk about, but um, just trying to help you understand what I mean when I say, well, uh, what is the power of whiteness in, in American history? Very first Congress, for Americanization. Uh, the Naturalization Act passed in 1790 in that first Congress stipulated that to naturalize as an American citizen, you had to be free and white. So um, just by the happenstance of me being born white, um, I'd have a chance of naturalizing as a U.S. citizen. Uh, someone who by the happenstance of not being born white, it would be prevented from U.S. citizenship. So whiteness is imbued with a certain amount of power right from the get-go, our very first Congress. Other examples, uh, Senator Calhoun on the floor of the United States Senate at U.S. Um, deciding what to do about land that it seemed it would acquire from Mexico as a result of the U.S.-Mexican War. Um, Calhoun is, is making the case that, uh, well, it's, it's attractive to acquire new land, that's great, but I am fearful of the non-white peoples uh, on that land. And he makes this speech uh, basically saying, uh, our government, sir, is the government of a white race. In his estimation, democracy is the government of a white race and uh, trying to absorb non-white peoples uh, would destroy American democracy. That's his uh, sense in 1848. Uh, the Supreme Court weighs in uh, in the Dred Scott decision, 1857. Uh, one of the things they argue is that African-Americans have no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. Please understand that, no rights. Uh, obviously, the Civil War um, is the central uh, dramatic event in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, 600,000 uh, Americans uh, die as a result, um, us killing each other. Uh, but, you know, in the wake of that, we, we attempt to implement uh, constitutional amendments. We outlaw slavery, we establish civil rights in the 14th Amendment for Black people and voting rights in the 15th Amendment. And yet uh, they, we, we spend the next 100 years stripping those rights away from them. Uh, obviously after federal forces are removed from the Reconstruction South, Jim Crow takes over and in 1896, the Supreme Court puts a stamp of approval on separate but equal, on segregation in the US. So uh, simply sh um, sharing those as the backdrop for what's taking place within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, it's born into a fraught American racial culture. Really important uh, to understand that we can't divorce what's happening in broader American society from what's happening within uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The other thing to keep in mind in terms of a big picture kind of framing um, of the racial story is that uh, there's this 19th century social development theory at play. Uh, really influential Americans such as Thomas Jefferson believe in this development theory. It's sort of the standard way of thinking about different societies and civilizations. Uh, and the argument is that all societies, all groups go through these uh, development stages from savagery to barbarism and from barbarism to civilization. And the uh, idea is that as uh, a group of people, a society transitions along this trajectory, they leave the markers of savagery and barbarism behind. So a couple of those markers are seen as uh, adherence to despotic rule, 
for authoritarian governments uh, and polygamy. Those are a couple of markers of savagery and barbarism. And these development thinkers looking at, uh, uh, at Anglo Saxon say, hey, here's this great example. Uh, they leave polygamy and adherence to despotic rule behind as they march across Europe, uh, occupy Britain, and then jump the pond, uh, establish a new nation bound, uh, founded on principles of liberty and equality. They are uh, the prime example then of what it means to be civilized, right? Um, these very same development thinkers then look in on uh, these ostensibly white people in the Great Basin. And they say they are actually uh, performing non-whiteness. Uh, Mormonism, in their estimation, represents a fearful deterioration away from civilization, backward into barbarism and savagery. Uh, those Latter-day Saints have given their free wills over to uh, the despots, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, and they're engaging in these are markers of barbarism and savagery. Okay? Uh, so uh, it's important to uh, understand uh, from the outsider's perspective, Latter-day Saints represent not merely a suspect religion, but in fact, a threat to American democracy. Uh, the, that's what's at stake. Um, and it becomes uh, a racial problem in the minds of some people. Um, in my book, I obviously developed this a lot more. I'm just going to share just a couple of, uh, one example, actually, um, from Dr. Robert Ruffalo. Uh, he's a medical doctor sent west with uh, Johnson's army, and he observes Latter-day Saints for a couple of years and then files a report with the United States Senate in 1860 as he's leaving the territory. And in this report, uh, he actually argues that uh, Latter-day Saint polygamy is giving rise to a new degraded race. Uh, you have to divorce yourself from uh, 21st century understandings of race. Uh, scholars in the 21st century, we say race is a construct. It's what we have imagined in our mind. It's not a biological reality. Um, in the 19th century, it's a very fraught and fluid and illogical uh, uh, racial culture. And you have uh, medical doctors even suggesting that uh, this religious practice of polygamy could give rise to a degraded uh, race. So Bartholo in his Senate report says, uh, the Mormon of all the human animals now walking this globe is the most curious in every relation. Mormonism is a great social wonder which seriously affected the physical stamina and mental health of its adherents. His, in his estimation, polygamy is a central issue. He says it created a preponderance of female births. Now, there's no demographic evidence to uh, uh, verify this, but this is his conclusion. One man married to a, uh, you know, several women and the offspring, he believes, will be more uh, girls than boys in terms of uh, um, the children of polygamous relationships. Uh, he says it also creates high infant mortality. Uh, the children born into these relationships are sickly and they will die at higher rates than uh, those born into monogamous relationships. Uh, he also suggests that polygamy is producing a striking uniformity in facial expression, which included albuminous and gelatinous types of constitution and physical conformation among the younger portion of Mormons. Uh, no idea what albuminous and gelatinous types of constitution means, but that's what he is suggesting. Uh, he argues that uh, Polygamy is producing the degraded Mormon body, an expression of countenance and style of feature, which may be styled the Mormon expression and style, an expression compounded of sensuality, cunning suspicion, and smirking self-conceit, yellow sunken cadaverous visage, the greenish colored eyes, the thick protuberant lips, the low forehead, the light yellowish hair, and the lank angular person, constitute an appearance so characteristic of the new race, the production of polygamy, as to distinguish them at a glance. You can tell a Mormon when you look at them. Polygamy is producing a degraded race in the Great Basin. The degradation of the mother follows that of the child, and physical degeneracy is not a remote consequence of moral depravity. It's not just um, you know, a stodgy old Senate report that's filed away. It's picked up and republished by a variety of medical journals. 
There's a conference held at the New Orleans Academy of Science by the end of 1860 on the Mormon body. Uh, all of the doctors who attend that conference buy Bartholo's argument, except for one, who says, look, Mormonism has only been around for 30 years. It's too early to suggest that it's giving rise to a new race. He also says, I don't know what albuminous and gelatinous types of constitution means. Uh, we need to study the Latter-day Saints for at least 30 more years before we can firmly uh, conclude that a new race is arising in the Great Basin. Uh, but nonetheless, the rest of the doctors buy Bartholo's argument and push it forward, and it's republished in a variety of medical journals. Um, so that's just one example, then, of the way that Latter-day Saints become racialized in the 19th century as not white enough. And when you add in um, fears of race mixing, as I'm going to uh, show you, um, it, it creates profound concern not merely a suspect religious tradition, but American democracy is at stake. So um, with that as some context, then let me just share with you how I have come to view the Latter-day Saint racial story in terms of priesthood and temple descriptions. I think it's most helpful to view it in three phases, developing in three phases. Uh, the first couple of decades, uh, evidence is that we had open priesthood and temples. Uh, including uh, black priesthood ordination, uh, temple admission. Uh, then that gives way to segregated priesthood and temples, beginning with Brigham Young and firmly solidified uh, under Joseph F. Smith by 1908. Uh, the 1978 revelation then returns us to our universal roots, uh, not, not taking us in any sort of dramatic um, new direction but in fact, restoring us back to where we began. Uh, this gospel message uh, is for everyone. Uh, and 78 uh, restores us back to our universal roots. That's the three phases as I've come to understand. Let me give you my evidence to support those claims. So uh, the first lesson that I've learned in terms of studying this racial history is that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints created an inclusive racial vision in the first couple of decades. What evidence is there to support that? Uh, Joseph Smith claims at least four revelations uh, instructing him that the gospel must be preached unto every creature. I hope we understand uh, what that means. We love to quote every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Pay attention as we study the, the, the Doctrine and Covenants this year. Four different revelations, every creature. There's no ambiguity. Who's supposed to be left out? Every creature means every creature, and early Latter-day Saints seem to take that seriously. Uh, Jesus Christ himself declares unto Joseph Smith in January 1831, all flesh is mine. Think about these scriptures. Read the scriptures racially this year. Read the DNC racially. Find me evidence where uh, the, the, uh, the Lord is, is suggesting that uh, his children, who are of Black African descent, aren't a part of his family. He's claiming all flesh as his and bears to his witness that he is no respecter of persons. DNC 3816. Uh, he establishes qualifications for priesthood ordination. Um, he stipulated that every man, every man who embraced the priesthood with singleness of heart may be ordained and sent forth. It's not an issue of race, it's a matter of where's your heart, okay? Um, if you want to argue that the racial restrictions were in place from the beginning, you have to argue against the evidence, in other words. And the evidence suggests that there's an inclusive racial vision in the first couple of decades. Uh, we can go to July of 1833. Uh, William W. Phelps is the editor of the Evening and Morning Star newspaper in Jackson County, Missouri. Jackson County has now been defined as the Latter-day Saint Zion. William Phelps uh, is concerned what this will mean for his fellow Black Latter-day Saints. Zion has now been defined uh, in a slave state. What is that gonna mean for my fellow Black Latter-day Saints who might want to gather with the rest of the saints? I am concerned what that will mean for them because Zion is in a slave state. 
and there are laws passed by the state of Missouri that will govern a, a black person's ability to move freely in that state. So he writes this uh, editorial in the Evening and Morning Star called Free People of Color. And he says to his fellow Black Latter day Saints, if you're going to immigrate to the state of Missouri, you need to be aware of the, uh, the, the state's laws that govern your ability to move freely. And he quotes two sections of the Missouri State Code that stipulates if you're a free Black person, you have to have papers that substantiate your status as a free Black person. Otherwise, you are subject to being whipped and expelled from the state. And he doesn't want that to happen to his uh, co-religionists. So he says, so long as we have no special rule in the church as to people of color. The church has no special rules as to people of color, but the state of Missouri does. So please let prudence guide you as you immigrate to Missouri. This one column is enough to begin the Latter-day Saint expulsion from Jackson County. Uh, outsiders read this and they accuse the Latter-day Saints of inviting free Blacks to Jackson County to incite a slave rebellion, but not just that, to uh, also steal our white wives and daughters. Fear of race mixing being projected to the Latter-day Saints uh, almost from the beginning. Uh, they will attack uh, Phelps' uh, printing office. Uh, they'll scatter his press into the streets. Uh, they'll completely demolish his office, which is also uh, his home. Uh, they drag a couple of Latter-day Saints in the, into the town square and tire and feather them. That's the beginning of the Latter-day Saint expulsion from uh, Jackson County. Uh, other evidence of inclusive vision is just simply the fact that uh, people of Black African descent are being ordained to the priesthood. Elijah Abel is the most well-documented Black priesthood holder in Latter-day Saint history. Uh, he's ordained uh, an elder by Ambrose Palmer, the presiding uh, elder at New Portage, Ohio, on the 25th of January, 1836. Joseph Smith acknowledged this ordination with his signature on Elijah Abel's ministerial certificate two months later. He's then ordained by the end of that year to the third quorum of the 70 on the 20th of December 1836 by Zebedee Coltrane. Uh, the, remember, the 70s quorums in the 19th century are not general authority quorums as they are reconstituted in the 20th century. These are missionary quorums. And Elijah Abel will remain a member of the third quorum of the 70 for the rest of his life and will serve three missions for the church. In 1836, he receives his Washington anointing rituals in the Kirtland Temple, uh, and he's among the first to perform baptisms for the dead in Nauvoo. Uh, he will then move to Cincinnati uh, and won't immigrate to the Great Basin until 1853 with his uh, wife and, and young family. And we'll pick up his story a little bit later. I'm just using him as an example uh, black priesthood ordination in the first couple of decades. Um, other indications of this open vision, as the saints are building the temple in Nauvoo, uh, they publish an, uh, um, an editorial in the Times and Season newspaper uh, that also articulates this expansive vision. They envision people from every land and from every nation, the polished European, the degraded Hottentot, and the shivering Laplander flowing to that city. They anticipated, quote, persons of all languages and of every tongue and of every color who shall with us worship the Lord of hosts in his holy temple and offer up their horizons in his sanctuary. Uh, and we can go all the way to March of 1847 with Brigham Young uh, on record with an inclusive vision. Uh, in March of 1847, Brigham Young interviews a Latter-day Saint, a Black Latter-day Saint named William McCary. Uh, McCary is complaining because uh, he has experienced racism at the hands of his fellow Latter-day Saints. And he comes to Brigham Young as, uh, as well as other Latter-day Saint leaders, and he says, look, I'm not being treated uh, fairly. And he's probably right. He's, he's, he's experiencing racism. Um, and Brigham Young, um, then as this conversation unfolds, uh, says to him, well, it's nothing to do with the blood, for one blood is God made all flesh. We're all, all a part of the same broader human family um, in Brigham Young's estimation. He's paraphrasing Acts 17.26. It's a common verse used by religious thinkers to push back in the 19th century against the polygenesis theory. 
Uh, some in the scientific community had argued that uh, uh, the, the, the different races were so different, so distinct that in fact, uh, they were different species. So black and white were different species, uh, different uh, origins, um, polygenesis, more than one genesis, okay? And religious believers in the 19th century, such as Joseph Smith, who actually uh, quotes this in his presidential platform, and now Brigham Young, uh, again, quoting or uh, paraphrasing Acts 17, 26, they push back against that, the polygenesis theory because uh, they say it's, it's, it's an affront to the Bible and, and the biblical creation. There's one creation and we're all of one blood uh, and God has made us uh, all of the same flesh. Um, William McCary continues to persist. Uh, he says, well, I think it's because of my skin color that I don't have any leadership roles in the, in the church. And Brigham Young says, look, we don't have, we don't care about color. Um, and when McCary persists, uh, Brigham Young says, look, um, even in distributing priesthood authority, we don't discriminate. In fact, we have one of the best elders an African in Lowell, a barber. Brigham Young is on record in March of 1847 as favorably aware of a black priesthood holder. He's referring to Q. Walker Lewis, who's been ordained to the priesthood in the Lowell, Massachusetts branch by William Smith, Joseph Smith's younger brother, who was an apostle at the time. And Brigham Young is aware of Q. Walker Lewis because he calls him one of the uh, best elders, an African. He's aware that he is an elder, and he's aware of his African ancestry. Uh, everything that he says about uh, Q. Walker Lewis is matches what we know of Q. Walker Lewis. He's a barber by trade. He takes out ads in the Low Massachusetts newspaper. Uh, so Br Brigham Young then is on record as favorably aware of a black priesthood holder, uh, in March of 1847. That's sort of the uh, open uh, racial vision um, in the first couple of decades. Lesson number two then, um, outsiders look in on that same open racial vision and they come to conclude that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are too inclusive of the very people that the rest of white society knows should be segregated and even enslaved. Latter-day Saints are welcoming Native peoples, Native Americans, at the same time that, remember, Andrew Jackson passes the uh, Indian Exclusion Act in 1830, the founding year of our faith. Um, Native Americans are being rounded up and moved beyond the Mississippi to solve the uh, Indian problem. And then, obviously, uh, African Americans are, are being enslaved. Um, and outsiders look in on what the Latter-day Saints are doing and suggest that they are being too inclusive of the very people that the rest of white society know should be excluded and even en enslaved. So here are just some samples of the evidence that I found in terms of how outsiders perceive this open racial vision. These are accusations leveled against them uh, in the 19th century. Uh, uh, Latter-day Saints accepted all nations and colors into their earthly kingdom was one accusation leveled against them. Uh, Latter-day Saint elders maintained communion with Indians and walked out with colored women, a uh, charge leveled against Mormon missionaries preaching in the South. Uh, Latter-day Saints welcomed all classes and characters into their society. They included aliens by birth and people from different parts of the world as members of God's earthly family. In the 21st century, we would think, yeah, this is great. Uh, this is great PR for us. You have to understand in the 19th century, uh, these are accusations uh, that Latter-day Saints don't understand the proper racial hierarchy. Uh, Latter-day Saints honored the natural equality of mankind without accepting the Native Indians or the African race. They accept the two uh, um, members of American society that the rest of American society knows should be excluded. Uh, in Missouri, a charge leveled against them was that they had opened an asylum for rogues and vagabonds and free Blacks. They are accepting the very dregs of society in, um, and that Mormons promoted black ascendancy over the whites. They don't understand the proper racial hierarchy operating in America, even suggesting black ascendancy over whites. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, Edward, Strutt, uh, Edward Strutt Abdi was a British officer on tour of the United States in the 1830s. Uh, he comes across a, a copy of the Book of Mormon becomes aware of this new religious tradition. 
Um, he goes back to Britain and writes a three volume history of his tour of the United States. Uh, and in it, he mentions this new religious sect that he entered. Uh, but he says, um, uh, the Book of Mormon ideal that all are alike unto God, including black and white, made it unlikely that the saints would remain unmolested in the state of Missouri. They have an open racial vision that's going to get them in trouble, he concludes. And he proves to be prophetic on that uh, note. Especially after polygamy is openly acknowledged after 1852, uh, then um, fears of Latter-day Saint... Uh, the Latter-day Saints open racial vision just animates outsiders' perspective of what's going on in the Latter-day Saint, uh, in Latter-day Saint families. And so uh, a variety of political cartoons are published across the uh, course of the 19th century, which suggests that Latter-day Saints are facilitating race mixing. Uh, this is just one example. Uh, it's published in John Sirwood's A Comic History of the United States in 1870. Simply titled A Mormon Family Out for a Walk. And you'll notice uh, the enfeebled male, male patriarch out front, and then the long string of wives, and then the seemingly endless string of children. But it's not uh, the number of wives and children that I think we should pay attention to, but it's the de facto interracial nature of this imagined Latter-day Saint family. So you have a stereotypical black mammy from the plantation south, you have an Asian wife, and you have a Native American or Pacific Islander wife. In many states in the nation, at least one or two of these uh, 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 imagined marriages would be illegal. So the accusation is that Latter-day Saints are willing to facilitate race mixing when the rest of American society knows that it should be illegal. Uh, and once again, the accusation isn't just that polygamy is destroying the traditional family. The accusation is that it's destroying the white race and making it unfit for democracy. Democracy is the government of a white race, Senator Calhoun said. Okay, so remember what's at stake in the minds of outsiders. Um, and most of the uh, political cartoons I found uh, had the white male patriarch, and then the wives are interracial. This one actually turns the gender dynamics around. So think about the messaging here. This is published in Alfred Trimble's The Mysteries of Mormonism in 1882. It's simply titled A Colored Mormon. 1882, this is after federal troops have been withdrawn from the Reconstruction South. White supremacists are reasserting white supremacy in the South. If you're a black man, you can and were lynched for even looking at a white woman incorrectly. So think about what messages are being conveyed here. Latter-day Saints allow Black men to marry not just one white woman and look at her lecherously, but more than one white woman. They are facilitating race mixing yet again, uh, making it unfit for democracy, but it's even worse when uh, the Mormon is black, uh, or, or the male, uh, I should say, is, is black, right? So they're projecting fears of the black beast rapist onto the Latter-day Saints, suggesting that Latter-day Saints uh, facilitate this kind of interracial mixing. And uh, these accusations go all the way up through uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, this is um, uh, sheet music um, published in 1904-1905 by Saul Bloom's Publishing House in New York. Uh, it's performed on Broadway. It's billed as one of Saul Bloom's uh, hits for that year. Coon songs were a music genre popular from the 1880s through the 1920s. Uh, they're designed to denigrate and racialize and stereotype African Americans. In this particular song, uh, the charge is leveled not just at African Americans, but at uh, Latter-day Saints as well. And look at uh, the uh, Mormon Coon's long flowing beard. Uh, think about who is president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at this time, Joseph F. Smith. Uh, and in political cartoons, his beard is what is always emphasized. Um, it's not a stretch to suggest that uh, the Mormon Coon is, uh, I think, uh, Joseph F. Smith here. Uh, the chorus goes like this. I've got a big brunette and a blonde pet. I've got him short, fat, thin, and tall. I've got a Cuban guy and Zulu pal. 
They come in bunches when I call, and that's not all. I've got them pretty too, got a homely few. I've got them black to octoroon. I can spare six or eight. Shall I ship them by freight? For I am the Mormon coon. So once again, projecting fears of race mixing onto the Latter-day Saints, by suggesting that Latter-day Saints uh, facilitate race mixing, darkening the white race, making it unfit for democracy. So with those accusations in mind, uh, the most significant way uh, you claim whiteness for yourself in a fraught 19th century American racial culture is in distance from blackness. Latter-day Saints are labeled as not white enough in the 19th century. And what I see taking place across the course of the 19th century is moving away from our own black Latter-day Saint converts towards whiteness. Uh, putting in fits and starts racial priesthood and temple restrictions in place uh, across the course of the 19th century. So uh, let me share with you the evidence to, to support this claim. Um, so remember, uh, after that meeting with William McCary in March of 47, Brigham Young will lead uh, the advanced group of Latter-day Saints in the Salt Lake Valley. In the meantime, he's appointed a man by the name of William Appleby uh, to survey the conditions of the various branches of the church on the East Coast. Appleby, by his own account, travels over 2,000 miles uh, over the summer of 1847, going from branch to branch and uh, sort of learning the condition of the various branches. Uh, it's what he finds in the Low Massachusetts branch, however, that disturbs him, so much so that he pens a letter to Brigham Young, uh, really trying to figure out what's, what's going on here. Guess who he meets in the Low Massachusetts branch? The very person that Brigham Young called uh, one of our best elders, Q. Walker Lewis. But William Appleby is disgusted by this. Do we really allow this in our church? Do we allow black priesthood ordination? Uh, that's what he writes to Brigham Young. Now, dear brother, I wish to know if this is the order of God or tolerated in this church i.e. to ordain Negroes to the priesthood. And then his second question is even more disturbing uh, because he's not just met uh, Key Walker Lewis as an ordained elder in the Low Massachusetts branch, something that we know Brigham Young is already aware of because he calls him one of our best elders. But he learns that uh, Key Walker Lewis's son Enoch is also a member of the church and has married Mary Matilda Webster, another member of the church, but she's white. And they have a child together. The pre-Civil War term for race mixing is amalgamation. It's borrowed from metallurgy, meaning the mixing of metals, and applied to race mixing, meaning the mixing of races. And Appleby is obviously aware of this uh, term because he uses it in his letter to Brigham Young. So first question, do we allow black priesthood ordination? Second question, do we allow amalgamation? If we do, he says, I have yet got to learn it. We know uh, that Appleby is a racist because uh, then he writes in his journal that night, I've never been so disgusted in all my life. Oh woman, where is your shame? He writes to Mary Matilda Webster for marrying a black man. And to think that they're both members of my faith, he says he's never been so disgusted in all of his life. So we have a sense of his attitude. Uh, he um, gets to meet with Brigham Young and give his report to Brigham Young personally. 3rd of December, 1847. Remember, Brigham Young goes to the Great Basin and then returns to winter quarters. Uh, he will meet with uh, William Appleby on the 3rd of December and uh, get William Appleby's report. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we only have 13 handwritten lines as the minutes of that meeting. It goes on for over four hours. I don't know what they all talked about. If they talked about priesthood, it doesn't show up in those 13 handwritten lines. But what does show up is a deep concern over race mixing. 
Brigham Young has returned uh, to the quarters to find out that William and Carrie, the very Black Latter Day Saint who he had defended um, and said, you know, uh, we don't care about the color. And in Brigham Young's absence, William McCary started his own schismatic group, uh, and it was based upon sexualized sealing rituals to white women. He was excommunicated, um, as were other members of his group. And now also being met with news of Mary Matilda Webster and Enoch Lewis's interracial marriage in the Massachusetts branch. So the minutes, those 13 handwritten lines, those, those minutes of that meeting then express profound concern over race mixing to the point that Brigham Young even advocates capital punishment as the penalty for interracial mixing. It's a sentiment that he will, this is a private minutes of a private meeting. He will actually preach that um, in the 1860s. Uh, the penalty for race mixing is death on the spot, he'll say in a journal of discourse um, sermon. So he is obviously disturbed by this, but they don't mention priesthood in those minutes. The first time that he openly articulates then a race-based priesthood restriction is on the 23rd of January, 1852 uh, to the territorial legislature in Utah. Uh, his most forceful articulation comes on the 5th of February, 1852. Uh, the legislature is an all Latter-day Saint legislator. And remember the roles of politics and religion are dramatically over intertwining in this legislative session. Uh, so you have Brigham Young as territorial governor, also prophet and president of the LDS church, Orson Pratt, apostle and legislator. Um, so it's really difficult to kind of, um, they, they know conflict in mixing those roles. Uh, um, they're debating what to do about uh, black enslaved people being who have been brought to Utah territory uh, by their white enslavers. Uh, converts from the South, some of the black enslaved are also Latter-day Saints. You have white enslavers enslaving their fellow co-religionists, in other words. They have um, uh, been brought to Utah Territory. Uh, what do we do about this? What laws shall govern the relationship between those uh, two groups? And the legislative session, uh, they're debating what law uh, they should pass. And um, in the process, Brigham Young will articulate his version of a racial uh, restriction. He will only draw upon uh, what he calls the curse of Cain. Cain kills his brother Abel. And as a result, a uh, curse comes upon Cain. Uh, Brigham leaves Cain's descendants. Uh, that night, the founding of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by a couple of hundred years. It's sort of just this broader Judeo-Christian understanding of the mark that God put upon Cain, even though the Bible doesn't say it. Uh, the belief was it was black skin. Um, and because uh, Cain killed Abel, all of Abel's descendants will have to receive the priesthood before any of Cain's supposed descendants uh, can be eligible for the priesthood, is the way that Brigham Young articulates it. Uh, and remember, it's coming out of a debate in this legislative session Orson Pratt is actually arguing that black men should be allowed the right in 1852 Utah Territory. And some of what Brigham Young um, is uh, uh, preaching against is uh, notions of black voting rights in Utah Territory and black equality. He speaks out stridently against it in opposition to Orson Pratt. So the very same speech, these are three just quotes from the very same speech on the 5th of February. We just as well make a bill here for mules to vote as Negroes or Indians, he says. You cannot find within men upon the earth who are the seed of Cain any that possess knowledge and sensibility enough to vote. What are we doing? Uh, what we are doing, uh, trying to do today is to make the Negro equal with us in all our privileges. My voice shall be against it all the day long, Brigham Young says. And uh, in terms of the racial priesthood restriction, if there never was a prophet or apostle of Jesus Christ spoke it before, now hopefully, uh, you know, try to understand what he's saying here. Um, if if no prophet said it before, okay, Brigham Young is announcing that he is the first prophet to say it. He admits it. 
He's, he, he never claims that he's trying to find something that Joseph Smith told him. But he actually says in 1852, if there never was a prophet or apostle, Jesus Christ spoke it before. I tell you this, people that are commonly called Negroes are the children of Cain. I know they are. I know they cannot bear rule in the priesthood in the first sense of the word. Um, those three sentiments coming out of the exact same talk. Uh, Orson Pratt um, is disgusted that the legislature would even consider introducing slavery into Utah territory. He knew that the, the bill uh, legalizing it would be rejected in its entirety. He argued that only God administered divine curses and that they were not particular to a given time or place. They were not multi-generational. He may curse a people, but um, he's basically reifying and arguing in favor of the second article of eight. Uh, Jo uh, Brigham Young's articulation of the racial restriction violates the second article of faith. It says we're accountable for our own sins, not for Adam's transgression. And yet Brigham Young is holding the supposed descendants of Cain responsible for a murder in which they took no part. Orson Pratt um, doesn't ever mention the priesthood restriction, but does attack notions of multi-generational curses uh, he's strident that the legislature should not pass a uh, slave bill. Shall we take then the innocent African that has committed no sin and damn him to slavery and bondage without receiving any authority from heaven to do so? He found the idea preposterous and said it was enough to cause the angels in heaven to blush. Don't do this. The legislatures, uh, as a response to Pratt, they actually modify the bill that ultimately passes. Uh, we believe um, that they remove uh, one clause from the draft of the bill that would have made uh, the slave code that they passed um, perpetual, that would have passed on the condition of slavery to the next generation. They remove that and in doing so, um, pass a conservative form of gradual emancipation, meaning that all of those who were brought to Utah territory enslaved would die enslaved. But their condition of uh, enslavement would not pass to the next generation. So, you know, it at once legalizes uh, the kind of servitude that uh, is being brought into the territory, but um, a conservative form of gradual emancipation because it doesn't pass on the condition to the next generation. And we believe that's in response to that um, strident stance that he takes in the middle of these debates. Okay. So what happens to the uh, racial priesthood restrictions? Uh, it continues to take on a life of its own after this, and each succeeding generation unwilling to violate the precedent established by the preceding generation, even though Brigham Young's precedent violates the precedent of open ordination established under Joseph Smith. So the new precedent becomes Brigham Young's precedent. Uh, what happens with, uh, for example, Elijah Abel? He and his family arrive in 1853. They are rebaptized after their arrival. This is not uncommon in the 19th century. When immigrant trains arrive in the valley, they, most of the immigrant trains are rebaptized as an outward symbol of their recommitment in this new location, their rebirth in Christ in Utah Territory, their recommitment to the Latter day Saint cause. Abel and his wife Marianne are both rebaptized. Uh, they're rebaptized again during the Mormon Reformation, three baptisms. Uh, as outward symbols of their commitment to this faith. Abel's wife, Marianne, passes away in 1877. He wants the rest of his uh, temple rituals to be endowed and to be sealed to his wife for eternity. There is um, a belated remembrance that he appeals to Brigham Young for these rituals and is told no. If that's the case, I haven't been able to find it in the written record, and it may have been an appeal that took place just in person and doesn't survive in the written record. What does survive is his appeal to John Taylor, Brigham Young's successor. In 1879, Abel will make this appeal. So as late as 1879, if the racial restrictions are unambiguously in place, why would the leader of the faith, John Taylor, need to conduct an investigation? In fact, that's what happens. I'm suggesting that even as late as 1879, the racial restrictions aren't unambiguously in place because the leader of the faith doesn't know what to do about a black priesthood holder who wants to get the rest of his temple rituals. So Taylor sends Joseph F. Smith, a member of uh, the Quorum of the Twelve, to interview Elijah Abel. That interview takes place in 1879. 
Um, and uh, the church history department believes these are the minutes of that meeting. These were discovered in Joseph F. Smith's papers just a, a year or so ago and uh, verified to be in Joseph F. Smith's handwriting. Unfortunately, he didn't date the document, but everything in this document coincides with what we know about the interview with Elijah Abel. We believe these are his handwritten notes uh, when he went to interview Elijah Abel. Um, so, Elijah Abel basically, uh, you know, uh, tells his priesthood ordination story, he tells who ordains him, tells who gave him his Washington anointing rituals, says um, that um, over here, he says, Joseph Smith said he was entitled to the priesthood and all the blessings he received. Um, and he received a patriarchal blessing under the hands of a father, Joseph Smith, and, and his patriarchal blessing acknowledges he's an ordained elder. And it's also uh, entered, his entire patriarchal blessing is entered into the minutes of the meeting. Uh, John Taylor, uh, his conclusion is, well, um, you know, this must have been maybe a mistake uh, that Brigham Young corrected. Um, so we're going to let his priesthood stand, but we're not going to allow him temple admission. Either way, you stack it up. Someone had to, a prophet had to make a mistake, according to John Taylor's interpretation of what happened. Joseph Smith had to make a mistake by allowing black priesthood ordination, or Brigham Young had to make a mistake by um, uh, stopping priesthood ordination. Uh, John Taylor simply says, okay, we're going to let him die with his priesthood intact, but we're not going to allow uh, him to receive uh, his uh, endowment. And so you have the development of a priesthood, uh, or excuse me, a temple restriction to coincide with the, the, the priesthood restriction. Elijah Abel remarkably will remain faithful. In his early 70s, he will be sent on a third mission for the church. He will go to Ohio. Uh, he will preach in Ohio as an ordained member of the third quorum of the 70. He's exercising his priesthood as a black man. He will return and he will die within two weeks of his return to the Salt Lake Valley. I don't know who wrote his obituary. It's not a typical eulogy. It's published in Deseret News. Whoever recognizes the shrinking space for full black participation in their chosen faith pushes back against that by just simply reciting the dates of uh, Elijah Abel's priesthood certificates of ordinations. Uh, and then notes that um, he labored successfully in Canada and also performed a mission to the United States from which he returned about two weeks ago. He died in full faith in the gospel. Uh, from there, from 1884, his death until the beginning of the 20th century, um, uh, the, the racial restrictions take on growing precedent, accumulating precedent. Uh, they, uh, the leadership continues to receive letters and, and different circumstances that they try to address. What do we do about someone who is a mixed racial ancestry? How do we deal with this? By 1907, uh, they simply put in place a one drop policy. Uh, this is what's going on in the rest of segregated America. Uh, states are passing increasingly stringent laws that stipulate, um, you know, how much blood is how they understood it. We now understand it as DNA, but uh, how much blood, how much black blood can a person have and still be defined as black? And some states adopt one drop rules, meaning you can have 99 white ancestors and one black ancestor and you're still legally considered black in that state. And the church adopts a one drop policy for priesthood and temple admission in 1907. Uh, the descendants of Ham may receive baptism and confirmation, but no one known to have in his veins Negro blood, it matters not how remote a degree, so that's the one drop part of it, can either have the priesthood in any degree or the blessings of the temple of God, no matter how otherwise worthy he may be. It's not based on worthiness. In other words, it's based on race, and that's racism. So the church puts in place a one-drop policy in 1907, or excuse me, 1908, I believe the restrictions are solidified uh, uh, with Joseph F. Smith. 
And the last step in my estimation is erasing from collective Latter-day Saint memory the Black priesthood holders and Black Latter-day Saint pioneers who complicate the white story. So I, I, I found four data points for Joseph F. Smith. Um, and you see then um, his uh, memory deteriorating um, by 1904 and 1908. So in, 19, in 1879, remember, he uh, defended Abel's priesthood as valid, uh, and he interviewed Elijah Abel uh, personally. In 1895, he reminded LDS leaders that Abel was ordained to the priesthood at Kirtland under the direction of the prophet Joseph Smith. Then the slippage begins. In 1904, he called Abel's ordination a mistake that was never corrected. And in 1908, he claimed that Abel's priesthood ordination was declared null and void by the prophet himself. So in that new memory, he's putting the priesthood and temple restrictions in place from the beginning. They've always been there. God put them in place. Man can't do anything about it. It will take a revelation to get rid of. That becomes the new memory for the 20th century. And that's the memory that Latter-day Saint leaders start to embrace in the 20th century, that the racial priesthood and temple restrictions were in place from the beginning. Temples and priesthood have always been white uh, and we can't do anything about it. Uh, at the very same meeting, um, Joseph S. Smith uh, decided that missionaries should not take the initiative in proselyting among the Negro people. But if Negroes or people tainted with Negro blood apply for baptism themselves, they might be admitted to church membership in the understanding that nothing further can be done for them. In other words, as a church, we made deliberate decisions to stop seeking black converts. Joseph Smith says unto every creature by 1908, stop proselyting amongst people of black African descent. So that's how you claim whiteness for yourself, is in distance from blackness. And that passage to whiteness, I think, is um, solidified under Joseph F. Smith. Uh, 70 years later, uh, President Kimball then um, announces a revelation which returns the church to its universal roots, in my estimation, restores what was lost in its 130 year quest for whiteness is, is how I see it. Um, so that's a, a sort of the history in, in uh, the phases that I see it um, and, and happy to talk through this in, in the in the Q&A. Um, let me just end um, with this. Um, so, so what can we do? Um, what, is, what does this mean? Um, in my estimation, uh, one of the things I've learned from the Century of Black Mormons project is uh, just the very way that we as Latter-day Saints have given power to whiteness, that white has been seen as normal in our theology uh, and in the way that we have applied notions of race um, that if something isn't white, it's seen as a deterioration or even a curse, a deterioration away from whiteness or even a curse. I'm hoping that understanding our own racial history, the way that white, even white Latter-day Saint converts were denigrated as not white enough, should help us to kind of rethink this. In the Century of Black Mormons project, uh, you know, the church's official position is always that um, its membership records have never kept track of racial categories. So we don't know how many, um, uh, you know, people of various racial categories uh, have been Latter-day Saints. Uh, what we've found actually in doing the research for the Century of Black Mormons is that um, racial notations are often entered in, into the margins, which just reifies the notion that white is normal. Uh, these are just three examples from, from our project. Um, and you'll notice all three of their membership records. Uh, these are Black Latter-day Saints, Nettie Kirchhoff, uh, founding member of the Oshkosh, Wisconsin branch. This is her 1925 LDS census record. And remember there are no racial categories, but up here the clerk just can't help but write colored, right? No one's writing white. You can scroll through these membership records page after page after page, and there are no racial notations. And then uh, there's a black convert and uh, the clerk or the missionary who creates the membership list can't help but write 
uh, colored or Negro blood, or in John Burton's case, who was an enslaved man baptized in Missouri, buried in Parowan, Utah. And this is his donation of $15 towards the building of the first chapel in Parowan. And the clerk who writes down his donation, I write African next to his name. Henry Barr, baptized in North Carolina, writes colored next to his name. So in other words, white is seen as normal. And something that's not white in Latter-day Saint thinking has uh, meant a deterioration away from normal or even a curse. We need to accept diversity as a part of uh, our heavenly parents, family, and we're all equal. Um, stop seeing white as somehow normal and uh, black, black or brown as somehow a deterioration away from white. Uh, our heavenly parents are the authors of, of diversity. We're all their children and all equal in their side, uh, uh, eyes. Um, also, uh, obviously the race and the priesthood essay um, disavows all the previous teachings that we've just sort of talked through. Um, I hope we understand it was approved by the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and that they unequivocally condemn all racism that includes within the church, past and present in any form. Um, so for me, um, in my estimation, it's much more profitable for us to learn from our collective history rather than defend or deny it. What lessons can it teach us? Latter-day Saints experienced racialization at the hands of outsiders. Racialized is not white enough. Okay, and I've given you evidence, I hope, to support that claim. And Latter-day Saints engaged in racism on the inside. What better people than to lead out on issues of racial inequality and social justice in the 21st century. Rather than being hobbled by our racial past, what if we owned it and used our shared history to stand in places of empathy? What if we were willing to work against racial injustice because we experienced a soft form of it ourselves? What if we were willing to speak up and stand up against systemic racism because we engaged in it ourselves and have come to understand its consequences? What if we were willing, like Jesus, to claim all flesh is our own? I believe in the universal racial vision that was established uh, in the Latter-day Saint tradition. It was radical, uh, it was universal. I believe Jesus Christ when he says he's no respecter of persons. I believe him when he says he claims all flesh is his own. And as his disciple, I believe that it's my obligation to also claim all flesh is my own, to see race, to acknowledge when our black and brown brothers and sisters experience racism, not to get defensive, but to listen, to acknowledge that their experiences may be very different from my experiences, to acknowledge that their racial journey may be very different from my racial journey, and to fulfill our baptismal covenants, to stand in places of empathy. I believe we have a lot to offer the world uh, in terms of race, but we have hobbled ourselves because of our own fraught racial history. In my estimation, it's better to own it, to live up to it, and to claim all flesh as our own. That's my faith, that's my testimony, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Wonderful. Thank you, Brother Reeve. Um, I see some questions coming into the chat. Uh, please, this is the time for you to do that. Uh, please start putting in um, some of your questions. Um, and for those who are members of the Gilbert Region Council, if you'll kind of start sifting through those and identifying questions you feel like would be very uh, um, important for us to discuss. Um, so, Brother Reeve, I'm going to start with one of them that I saw come through, and actually there's several that, that are kind of uh, showing up, and, I, and I, hope, I hope I can demonstrate my bias a little bit here, um, but would you mind, maybe, maybe for those of us who are not uh, very versed 
in um, in some of the social theories uh, that academics use. But the the newest boogeyman is the critical race theory. Uh, that is that is becoming a, a very political issue, even though it's been kind of part of social theory for a really long time. Would would you mind commenting? Maybe give us a good definition, and then some of the questions are um, uh, your thoughts on critical race theory. How do we how do we best address its teachings among the youth? Um, it's not enough to be against racism. You have to be anti-racist to really end racism. American has a whiteness problem. So would you mind kind of clarifying some of these things so that we have a better understanding of what, what, what that is and how we can help? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, this past year, I've just sort of been baffled by how this has become politicized. Um, so in my estimation, it's been reduced to a few um, talking points that seem to have originated with some right ring um, kind of news organizations. And uh, it, it's become, a, in my estimation, a, a gross uh, caricature of what it actually is in practice um, to, to actually convey the sense that uh, white people are, are under attack. Um, and that critical race theory means that you can't be white or that, uh, you know, what I get, what I see being passed around on social media just doesn't match up to um, my experience. Uh, it, it, it seems to be uh, like those political cartoons that I showed you. That, uh, what I see being passed around are, are political cartoons of critical race theory. Uh, turning it into a boogeyman, um, you know, the Utah legislature um, passed a message bill against critical race theory. Um, it's not being taught in Utah schools. Critical race theory is being developed, uh, was developed, you know, beginning in the 1970s in, in legal, uh, in law schools, uh, just who, who looked at laws across the course of U.S. history and said, look, um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, civil rights efforts were uh, aimed at getting rid of Jim Crow laws, so ending de jure racism or racism by law, right? Um, but, uh, you know, let's look at the ways that it plays out and the ways that these various laws have played out across the course of American history. I gave you just a few examples um, in, in the 19th century. Those are laws that, that didn't treat white people and black people the same. And uh, critical race theory said, look, um, the ways that these got baked into our system, we have to uh, acknowledge that and figure out ways to, you know, um, make the law equal in the sight of all people. And then it also um, transitions into education. Um, so the of education um, than the ways that, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, right? Uh, the ways that race has um, also not been treated equally uh, in our education systems. And it, it had an impact on um, my own profession. Um, uh, historians uh, beginning in the 1970s, um, you, you know, they, they looked at uh, the triumphal narrative of American history. Um, and they said, so what are the roots of that triumphal narrative? Um, Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis, uh, which saw the story of America as a line between savagery and civilization. And as we pressed westward, we established civilization and pushed savagery away. Um, think of the language of all of that, right? That's the way that we told our story. And um, Charles Darwin's... Uh, um, well, and just sort of the uh, um, notions of survival of the fittest, right? And uh, the white people survive, therefore they're the fittest. Those sort of informed our triumphal narrative in the 1970s. We sort of crashed into Vietnam. Uh, we, we lost, um, the triumphal narrative didn't look so triumphal and historians started to say, well, what does uh, the American story look like if we consider it from the perspective of African-Americans or Chinese immigrants? or Native Americans, instead of uh, labeling them savage, what does that line look like if we look at it from their perspective, right? How does the triumphal narrative look uh, from various other perspectives? How does it look 
uh, how does um, uh, the free exercise clause, the free exercise religious clause look if we look at it from the perspective of a suspect minority group? Let's say the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. How well have we done in living up to uh, notions of freedom of religion when you have a state-sanctioned extermination order issued against a minority religious group? Those are the kind of questions that have animated sort of the way that we tell our story. When I teach my freshman level American history class, I wonder if legislatures are going to come into my room and now say, like, what you can and can't teach. We talk about Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal at the same time that he's handing his quill plan to his black slaves, Jupiter, to dip, to, to dip in his inkwell. Jefferson himself embodies the great American paradox. The man who established these fundamental religious, uh, excuse me, uh, principles of freedom and equality owned slaves. That's the great American paradox. And my sense of American history is that it's just a desire for minority groups to realize those founding ideals in their own lives. And that's the way that I teach my freshman level American history class. We established beautiful founding principles, but they haven't been realized in the lives of all people. And Latter-day Saints, for heaven's sake, should be well aware of that. The Free Exercise Clause, uh, the First Amendment, didn't work out so well for us across the course of the 19th century. But we wanted those rights realized in our lives. Same thing for African Americans, for heaven's sake, for Native Americans. Uh, so I see critical race theory becoming a boogeyman that I just don't understand. Honestly, I just don't understand it. Um, the way that I practice in my classroom seems so different from what I see being played out in these legislative sessions. It just feels foreign to me. I, I just don't get it. Like, I'm not supposed to talk about the fact that Jefferson owned slaves at the same time that he founded those founding principles. What does Lincoln mean in the Gettysburg Address when he says a new birth of freedom? Well, our first birth of freedom left people out, so we need a new birth of freedom. And why do we need a civil rights movement uh, if the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments after, uh, after the Civil War uh, were realized? Well, because we got rid of them by law. We got rid of, uh, we, we attempted to address those racial problems by law, but in practice, getting rid of racism is oh, much more difficult. And the backlash against critical race theory, in my estimation, is not helping. I don't know what they're afraid of, honestly. I just don't. Maybe um, that's not the answer you wanted. That's uh, how I see it. I knew I was kind of probably poking the bear a little bit, being a, a, a an, an educator in higher ed um, to defend some things. So I, I knew what I was getting into. I don't know if these guys did. So I, this is good. James, you got one? Yeah, it's almost two parts. So it starts with a, a question from Brother Fagrell and then kind of carries into a, a question that Brother Goodson asked. So the first question would be, why do you think so many so many religious educators, church leaders, and others have had such difficulty in talking about this as you have. The prophets have erred, that the error was perpetuated, and that we can still sustain and support prophets while recognizing a drift from truth on this issue. So why is there a difficulty? And then there's a follow-up after this, but let's go to that first point. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. You know, I've given presentations like this enough um, to know where what it boils down to. And, and I think... Um, Whoever asked that question, I think, hit the heart of the matter because it calls um, uh, prophetic fallibility or infallibility into question. Um, and so I think, um, you know, that's one of the sensitivities around this. Um, I, in my estimation, we don't do a great job as Latter-day Saints of letting our leaders be human. We tend uh, to put them on pedestals. And we tend to put them on such high pedestals that they sometimes feel completely out of reach. Uh, we create our problems in my estimation on that count um, because they feel so out of reach the first time then that someone learns of a mistake or uh, something that they did that doesn't match up to their expectations. Because we've created black and white thinking, 
they're out of here, right? It's either all all true or it's it, none of it's true, and um, they're out the door. I wish we created um, more complexity so that we can understand <laughs> and let these people be human, uh, because in their humanness, I find um, hope for my own stumbling walk with God. Um, so there's there's a great study out of Columbia where um, where they gave uh, students in um, some inner city schools in, in New York uh, three different curriculum projects. And one of them was just the standard curriculum about, uh, you know, three scientists um, who are well known, like Einstein and Madame Curie, and I can't remember the third one. Um, and it's sort of the standard, you know, here's their experiment that were so successful and they're brilliant and all these kind of things. And then the students who got to do that um, talked about all the experiments, talked about all the struggles that they had in their lives growing up, um, you know, Einstein struggling in school, talked about sort of a complex reality of their lives. Those students actually did better in their grades, in their outlook on life because they found hope that people who struggled actually could be successful. And I feel like as Latter-day Saints, we just missed the boat on this. Why can't we allow our leaders to, to be human? Uh, because in their humanness, I find inspiration and hope for myself. Uh, they were able to accomplish some pretty amazing things despite struggling with their own human frailties. And hopefully um, a weak error prone sinner like myself also uh, can potentially find hope. So for me, that's what it boils down to, um, notions of prophetic infallibility. Um, and so we struggle to acknowledge uh, this racial story, um, in, in my estimation. You know, um, uh, I guess for me, I, it's better uh, to live up, you know, to own it than it is to deny or defend it. And, and that's um, that's the stance that I like to take. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think we can actually handle it. In my sense, I know I teach uh, at, a, at a public university, but I teach a course on Mormonism. And, uh, you know, maybe this won't come as a surprise to you. Maybe it, it will. Almost every class that I've taught this course at the University of Utah, right, in a secular school, um, I've had students who are Latter-day Saints who say to me, I took this course because I want to know what they won't tell me over at the Institute. Their sense is that um, sometimes the church, the institution is hiding something from them. And my uh, interaction with this generation is give it to me straight. That's my experience in the classroom. They don't want the sugar-coated version. Um, so those are the students that I'm meeting. Um, and so for me, I just think it's better, like, let's deal with this. I think students can handle, hey, yeah, um, we, we had problems with racism. Let's, let's see what that looks like. How do we, um, lead out in abandoning racism like President Nelson has, uh, talked about if we don't talk specifically about what racism looked like within the church? Thank you have you. to use our own church history to be able to do so. So let me ask then a follow-up. Uh, it kind of it came a couple questions after Brother Fergrell's. You said, on this of prophetic infallibility, just can you ask, or can I ask, what perspective you have on prophets in this, in light of this history? When a student, in, when a student encounter this information, they may think, how can I trust what prophets are teaching now if they had, a, if they'd been so wrong in the past? What if, what if they're wrong now on things like LGBTQ issues? What do you see as, um, as the role of prophets in light of this history? So yeah, I have the answer ready. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've, like I said, I've done this, um, done these presentations enough that, um, yeah, I do have a few thoughts on that. Um, so, uh, you know, those are those are good questions. I, I hope we're having those kind of conversations in, in our seminary classrooms, for heaven's sake. Like, let's get real with some of these kind of questions. Um, let's let's help students kind of think through those kind of questions rather than have them go to the Internet and, and find out. Like, if we're not creating safe spaces for them, um, where, where do they go? 
Um, I love what uh, Terrell and Fiona put in the crucible of doubt. Airbrushing our leaders, past or present, is both a wrenching of the scriptural record and a form of idolatry. It generates an inaccurate paradigm that creates false expectations and disappointments. I think that's true. It creates false expectations that prophets are never going to mess up and disappointments. God specifically said that he called weak vessels so we wouldn't place our faith in their strength or power, but in God's. I like to uh, talk students, you know, through this when they ask those kind of questions. I like being a part of a faith tradition that has a prophet at its head, but when a, God makes a prophet a prophet, does he revoke his agency? The foundation of our Gospel plan, according to Latter-day Saints, is agency. We say we fought a war in heaven over agency. And those who are on earth chose agency. If you chose agency, what that really means is you chose messiness. If you give people agency, it means they have the ability to exercise it in horrible ways. How do we explain the Holocaust? Well, we say God... Honors people's agency, even to the point of allowing Hitler to murder six million Jews. But somehow he's going to come down and stop Brigham Young from saying racist things in 1852. He's going to revoke his agency. He allows us to make mistakes. That's what the plan is about. And in my estimation, a prophet is not um, a puppet and God is the puppet master. But in fact... He allows us all kinds of latitude uh, to make mistakes. If you voted for agency, you voted for messiness. And the way that I see sometimes Latter-day Saint history taught is it's all nice and neat and tidy in a, a nice, neat little bow. And when I see it taught that way, that's when I know um, something's wrong. Uh, as a historian, I expect messiness. The American Historical Association Statement on Standards of Conduct simply says, um, uh, multiple conflicting perspectives are among the truths of history. Uh, and so for me, um, <laughs> that means expect messiness. Um, and our Latter-day Saint plan, uh, like that's, that's exactly what it, what it is. I, I also like to use the Samuel principle articulated by President Benson. Um, it's, it's in a talk from like 1976. Um, so he was an apostle at the time. But he says, you know, uh, God, um, you know, calls Samuel. Uh, um, well, the people come to Samuel and say, we want a king. And Samuel says, no, um, kings are bad. And um, they keep persisting. And finally, um, Samuel says, you know, God says to Samuel, um, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Like, give them a king. Give them what they want. Um, let them suffer the consequences. Um, and President Benson says, this is the Samuel principle. God wanted it to be otherwise. I believe God wanted the racial story to be otherwise, but within certain bounds, he grants it to men according to their desires. He honors our agency. That's the foundation of the plan. Um, so think about Joseph Smith in the last 116 pages. He didn't want Joseph Smith to lose those 116 pages. We honored his agency. That's the Samuel principle at play. And then he says to Joseph Smith, how often have you transgressed the commandments and laws of God and gone, in, uh, gone on in the persuasions of men? You should have not feared man more than God. He's calling a prophet to repentance, like a prophet can sin, for heaven's sake. We have it in our scriptures. People who describe Joseph Smith as a megalomaniac, like I point to the scriptures where he's <laughs> saying God is calling him to repentance. Like a megalomaniac is not going to do that. Uh, that's evidence, right, that Joseph Smith is willing to be on record with his uh, own weaknesses and God calling him to repentance. And it happens more than once in the Doctrine and Covenants. The Kirtland Safety Society, another great example. Uh, it leads to what we call the Kirtland apostasy. Uh, so many people are saying Joseph Smith is a fallen prophet because the bank fails. So God could have just saved him all of that trouble, telling him, hey, don't found that bank, it's going to fail. He let him be human. He let him exercise his agency. He let him open an anti-banking society. 
those are just examples in my estimation of the Samuel principle in play. And I think the same thing is true with Brigham Young and race is uh, tragically like he lets Brigham Young express his racial views um, and uh, you know, lets us suffer the consequences. And I think we're still grappling with those consequences. Um, so for me, that's kind of the ways that I think this through the question about, well, what does that mean in the present? Um, the Doctrine and Covenants also says, you know, um, uh, in all patience and faith, we, we um, accept prophets as our leaders. And so sometimes it takes patience and it, sometimes it takes faith uh, to live in a prophetic tradition. And, um, you know, we saw the November 15, uh, 2015 policy last for three years, not 130 years. Um, it took patience and it took faith. Um, and I, I guess my hope is that, you know, there can be course correctives and, and you know, the good uh, hopefully wins out. Um, but I think those are all, those are good questions for students to be asking. Um, some people with LGBTQ issues, for example, um, talk about the parallels with, with race and the priesthood. I can understand those parallels, right? Um, are we simply trapped in sort of our cultural moment and our cultural understandings of, of what it means to be gay? Um, and how much is that influencing the way that our church leaders who grew up in a very different generation than us, you know, um, they're older than us. So is that influencing them? So potentially there are parallels there, but there are also important, important distinctions. Um, if you're just going to compare it with race and, and, and the priesthood, we have historical precedent for black priesthood ordination is one distinction. We don't have historical precedent for, for example, uh, gay ceilings, right? And the other important distinction is you can be gay and receive a temple recommend. It's possible to be gay, openly gay. I have friends who are openly gay and have temple recommends. You couldn't be black and receive a temple recommend. So there are also distinctions, right, in the way that, that it plays out. Now, I know that, um, you know, uh, if, if we're going for, um, you know, gay ceilings, then, then you know, there, there are also all kinds of fraught issues there. Um, so I'm not suggesting otherwise that it's all hunky-dory. I'm, I'm not in any way doing so, but when those parallels are brought up, you know, um, those are the distinctions I also see. Thank you. I, I appreciate that and your thoughts. Um, Ricky, back to you. I got a, I got a question. I could, yeah, I do too. Go ahead, Kevin. All right. Um, Paul, what yeah. truth is there to the idea that Lester Bush's essay on the racial ban was being read and studied by both Bruce R. McConkie and Spencer W. Kimball early in 1978? And in addition, what other insights could you give us to 1978 that could be influencing the brother in, in that decision. Yeah, so I don't know about Bruce R. McConkie and Lester Bush's article, but um, uh, President Kimball in, in Lester Bush's article, there is actual evidence. Um, uh, his son, Edward Kimball, right, who wrote his biography, um, confirmed with Lester Bush. So I have this directly from Lester Bush himself. Um, that, uh, and Lester Bush was shown uh, his Lester Bush was shown President Kimball's marked up Lester Bush article. President Kimball read it, marked it up, and his son Edward showed that to Lester Bush. So uh, there is evidence that uh, that influenced him, right? So, so Lester Bush's article calls into question that the racial restriction was in place from the beginning. Um, it says there's no evidence of it, um, no evidence that it uh, originates with Joseph Smith um, and calls in that narrative, that new narrative that Joseph F. Smith uh, implemented, you know, um, in, in my presentation. So Bush will be a historian who, who goes back and, and calls that all into question. So I think it's influential um, for, for President Kimball. Now, in terms of other contexts surrounding 1978, um, we're all anxiously awaiting a new book to come out from Matt Harris who has been given unprecedented access to a lot of these sources. I've, uh, he's done some podcasts, his, his, his book is almost finished. I've been on some panels with him at academic conferences. So I've heard some of his presentations. 
He's tackling the 20th century. My book um, does a broad brush stroke of, of 20th century in that last chapter, and he's gone into the details uh, for the 20th century. Um, what, what I've heard him say is that when President Kimball became president, he was ready to lift the restriction from day one. What it took was getting unanimity amongst uh, the Quorum of the Twelve. President Kimball is on record as early as um, 1963 as an apostle calling in a private letter to his son. So it's not public, but we now know about it, um, calling the priesthood restriction a possible error as early as 1963, a possible error. Uh, so we know that he has a very different uh, view of this. Um, he spends uh, then um, time trying to get um, people on board. So you have various perspectives represented amongst uh, um, the, the Quorum of the Twelve. And you have some of the hardliners who are you know, pretty recalcitrant and he spends time uh, sort of nursing them along. Prior to his administration, um, you know, Heber, um, excuse me, Hubie Brown spent the um, 1960s trying to get it reversed. Hubie Brown's perspective was, there's no revelation that began it. Can't point to any revelation that began it. Um, McKay has redefined it as a policy. Um, so let's get rid of it by policy vote. And, um, made some efforts at trying to do so, um, but there were some hardliners who uh, said, you know, this is going to take a revelation. It's not going to be a policy vote. It's it's so entrenched. Um, so those are factors that are at play. I think it's getting unanimity. Now, remember, two people aren't present uh, in June of 1978. Stapley is in the hospital, and Peterson is absent. And both with sort of hardline racial positions, the, the rest of them, you know, um, have this experience on June 1st, and they are uh, the two who are absent are notified and agree to go along. Um, so um, unanimity is one problem that I think um, prevented it all the way back from the 1950s and 60s from taking place earlier. Uh, and I think Matt Harris's book is going to bear this out. He has the evidence support it, um, the presentations that I've heard, um, and was given unprecedented access to Hubie Brown's papers by the Brown family. Um, and Brown really spent the 1960s uh, doing everything he could to try to get it, um, to try to get it reversed and was unsuccessful um, because of a few holdouts. Uh, so that's something that's going on. Uh, the other pressures are international pressures. Unto every creature, those are there from the 1830s. Um, you have letters arriving from Nigeria, whole congregations who are calling themselves Latter-day Saints. Um, th those pressures are coming to bear upon the leadership. Uh, it's crash, the priesthood policies and temple policies are crashing into uh, the Lord converting people without even missionaries present in places like Africa. Then they also announce, um, the temple in Brazil. And Latter-day Saint leaders are flying to Brazil and meeting Black Latter-day Saints who are donating of their hard-earned money for buildings they know they will not be allowed to enter. And that starts to tug at the heartstrings of Latter-day Saint leaders as well. And the um, mixed racial nature of Brazil is also, uh, you know, as early as the 40s and 50s, uh, we have like, um, J. Reuben Clark, who is on record saying, we know we are ordaining people of uh, black ancestry. You, you can't ferret it out in Brazil. And, and, and ultimately you can't ferret it out anywhere. Uh, we know now with DNA evidence. Um, and I have some great stories in the Century of Black Mormons database that bears this out. I have white Latter-day Saint families coming to me uh, saying we have, DNA, we have African DNA in our ancestry in the 21st century. And we've traced it back to ancestor so-and-so, and we think that ancestor so-and-so should be in your database. And you know, our team does the research and uh, we have a couple of great stories in the database where um, the first person of black African ancestry that we have been able to document to receive full temple rituals uh, was the daughter of a black man and a white woman 
um, who passes as white, I, I think, um, and receives full temple rituals in 1845 in, in Nauvoo. And her ancestors um, in the 21st century continue to demonstrate uh, African ancestry in their DNA. So Brazil presents that kind of a problem. And um, the scholars who have looked at it said, basically, um, the question starts to be not how are we going to keep people out, but how can we make sure that they're in? Um, and by the time the temple in Brazil is dedicated, uh, the, the racial restrictions have been lifted. And those faithful Latter-day Saints who had contributed are in, in the dedication session in Brazil. So those are several factors that are surrounding what's going on um, leading up to the revelation in 1978. But Matt Harris said he's convinced that as soon as President Kimball becomes president, he is ready to lift the restrictions. He goes about behind the scenes working with the old hardliners who are more um, sort of stuck in trying to nurse them along. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Good, Brad. One question going back to the previous question. I have heard students struggle with this official declaration one, President Wilford Woodruff, as he says, the Lord will never permit me or any other man who stands as president of the church to lead you astray, um, et cetera, et cetera. How do you uh, resolve that and help them through that? Yeah, so um, context is enormously important for historians. And uh, I think context for that statement is incredibly important. Um, so May 1890, the Supreme Court hands down a decision that we don't talk about very much when we talk about OD2. It's the late corporation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints versus the United States. Late corporation because the Edmonds Tucker Act has disincorporated the LDS Church and it's designed to grind the church into dust. The church, uh, the late corporation of the church files suit trying to get the Edmonds Tucker Act uh, declared unconstitutional. The Supreme Court makes its decision in May of 1890, and in doing so, it actually upholds the Edmonds Tucker Act. Uh, and not only upholds the Edmonds Tucker Act, but actually gives it more expansive power. Because the Edmonds Tucker Act had prevented the government from taking into receivership LDS property that was used strictly for religious purposes. So until May of 1890, uh, the government was prevented from confiscating, for example, temples. But the uh, late corporation versus, uh, the, uh, versus the United States decision says, if those edifices used for religious purposes are actually also being used for illegal purposes, in this case, marrying people polygamously, you can uh, start uh, taking them into receivership. That's the context. Um, the new federal receiver uh, subpoenas Woodruff by September of 1890, um, designed to uh, gather evidence to start the process for confiscating the St. George Manti and Logan temples. Remember the St. George or the Salt Lake temple uh, hasn't been dedicated yet. Those temples are on the chopping block. Woodruff avoids the subpoena goes to California for a month and returns from California and issues uh, the manifesto by the end of September of 1890. Then he is faced with um, some opposition amongst the Latter-day Saints as he goes around Utah territory promoting the manifesto. You have some Latter-day Saints who have sacrificed so much in defense of polygamy start to suggest that Woodruff is a fallen prophet that uh, he's just simply bowed to political pressure um, and abandoned polygamy, something that saints have sacrificed so much for. So when Woodruff is saying, uh, the Lord isn't uh, going to let me lead the church astray, what he's doing is defending the manifesto as a revelation. The Lord will not give me a revelation that will lead the church astray. In opposition to uh, the point that is being made as he goes around uh, the territory, uh, you know, defending the manifesto. People are saying, you're a fallen prophet. This isn't a revelation. And he's saying, God won't give me a revelation that will lead us astray. Read also the rest of what he says, right? Um, he says, God showed me they'll be running through our temples. 
He's talking about this immediate context that I'm telling you. And the trade-off, a lot of times, even textbooks in Utah history call it a trade-off between polygamy and statehood. That's absolutely false. Statehood is still six years away. The immediate trade-off is we will abandon polygamy to preserve temple worship. It's an internal trade-off. Temple worship becomes more dear to the Latter-day Saints, and we will abandon polygamy to preserve temple worship. And that's the context for what Woodruff is saying. It gets stripped of the, that context and gets passed around as some sort of guarantee that um, apparently everything that a prophet says, even over the dinner table, you can take to the bank. Um, and the context, in my estimation, doesn't bear that out. The context is God won't give me a revelation that will lead you astray. He's defending the manifesto as a revelation. God has shown me that we'll be overrunning our temples um, if we don't do this. And he's calling uh, the manifesto a revelation. So that's, that's the context that I think uh, helps to understand that. Um, and when we pull that um, language from Woodruff out of that context, uh, we, we sometimes use it as, uh, you know, a hammer to hit people over the head with. Um, and, and in my estimation, that doesn't fit in into its 1890 context. Great, thank you. Um, we're, we're getting close to the end of these questions. If you have some, please, please continue to add them. Um, one question at the top is probably at the forefront of everyone's mind. And I think you've probably address this um, in different ways with different shades. I remember my first year teaching, I had a student raise his hand and it had nothing to do with what we were talking about. And he said, is the church racist? Um, and, and it was a moment where we had to pause and actually try to figure out what was going on in his head because it wasn't where we were going. But in, in this day and age, we have students who are dealing with um, different concerns when it comes to our history and they're applying it to our current, to our present. Um, if you put yourself into the seminary classroom, I know you deal with college age students, but if you put yourself into a high school classroom, um, what is the best way that you would minister to somebody whose faith is being uh, tested by this? Yeah. Um... You know, I would hope that their faith is anchored in Jesus Christ, and I would start um, with, uh, you know, the, that DNC verse uh, where Jesus Christ declares himself um, uh, as no respecter of persons and is claiming all flesh as his own. And um, we we don't need we don't need infallible prophets. We have an infallible Savior. And um, my hope is, um, this is what I try to do with my own kids, um, you know, uh, that, that their faith is anchored in Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we call ourselves the Church of Jesus Christ, and we try to emphasize that, but if, if we don't anchor our faith in Christ, um, then um, in my estimation, we, we, we can sometimes struggle. So I would, um, I would, I would begin there. And then, um, you know, point to the race in the priesthood essay, which condemns all racism past and present. That includes uh, within the church. Racism didn't become a sin after June of 1978. Racism is still a sin even when prophets engage in it. Um, and I would own it and simply say, um, you know, uh, Brigham Young, uh, this is obviously something that, um, you know, he's expressing uh, racist views in, in 1852. Um, let's also understand that this gospel is a gospel uh, that believes in eternal progression. This is pretty a radical idea if we compare ourselves to other um, Christian traditions, some of whom suggest that the afterlife is uh, eternity and hellfire and damnation. And we suggest, in fact, you can continue to progress after this life. That's pretty remarkable. So let's think about that in terms of Brigham Young. 
do we think that he is somewhere in the eternities stuck on his position from 1852? Some corner of the eternities stuck on his position from 1852? Um, my sense is that Brigham Young has repented, that he also wants us to repent. That includes confessing our sins, acknowledging racism, and then being willing to uh, own up to it, stand in places of empathy in the 20th century, 21st century, and be willing to lead out in issues of racial equality. And um, claim all flesh as our own, like our savior, model our, our pattern after him, and bring it right back to Jesus Christ. Um, that's, that's how I would um, uh, attempt to uh, anchor their faith in Christ and still deal with the racism. It, it, it's not helpful to deny it. I mean, I don't like it when I see it. I don't like the sugar-coated stuff when I see it. I don't like the excuses, the justifications. They don't work for me. They may work for some people. They don't work for me. Um, for me, it's better to say, hey, that looks like racism, so let's call it racism. Um, let's also, wh why sometimes I see people circling the wagons to defend Brigham Young. I don't see a need for that. We believe in eternal progression. I firmly believe Brigham Young has moved on and doesn't want us defending his position from 1852. He's moved on from it. Um, and I firmly believe he wants us to help the church as an institution to also repent and move forward but we can't do it without the confession. We can't skip the steps. And I feel like sometimes the church as an institution wants to skip those steps. And, and that means sort of just ignoring the past. Well, let's just make sure we're doing better in the future. Um, yeah, let's also confess. Uh, so denying it with a student like that who is already aware of it, I think gets us nowhere. Thank you. James, did, I, did you have one? Yeah, I, yeah, I just have one, to, or oh. James does. Yeah, Claire, you've raised Just, your hand twice now. Do you want to jump in? Claire? She may have been applauding. Those aren't raising hands. Those are those are my preach hands for everything oh, you're doing. <laughs> Got it. I thought you were raising your hand. Okay, it's all yours, James. Go. Um, just someone asked, you mentioned that the church, uh, we need to be willing to address these difficult issues. Uh, we need to, as seminaries and institute teachers, be more educated. Are there resources that you... Uh, and tools you would recommend us to enable us to be more prepared and have more information uh, for the times when some of these difficult situations or, or questions are asked. Are there any that you can recommend? Sure. Um, I have I have kind of a, a, maybe like a, a sort of bibliography. A lot of these are, you know, electronic um, things that are readily available. Um, I don't know, you know, what you what standards you guys have to meet in terms of <laughs> approved whatever, but I can pass it on to Ricky and and uh, he's he's welcome to share it with everyone. Awesome. If you would do that, that would be grateful and or greatly appreciated. I had a question that came to me in a, in a text because the chat wasn't working for them. Um, it, so let me get to uh, how the things we things we've done learned today impacted church leaders' teachings about interracial marriages and how these teachings and positions have shifted dramatically. So from what we've learned about race uh, in the history of the church, uh, how's that impacted interracial, the teachings of interracial marriage and then um, where we're at today? Yeah, I think concerns over race mixing really um, animates Brigham Young's transition from his position in March, 1847 to his position by um, January and February of 1852. That 5th of February speech in 1852 is really heavy um, we've gone back to the Pittman shorthand version, but Gene Carruth transcribed it. Um, you know, those speeches um, from that legislative session, many of them had never been transcribed. Uh, I sort of found them in my research for, for the book, Religion of a Different Color, and the Church History Department was gracious enough to have Gene transcribe them, let me use them. We're in the process of publishing them as a documentary history, and his 5th of February speech is, is absolutely devastating. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've cried over that speech. I probably read it more than anyone um, on the planet. We have Legene's um, transcription, um, which 
is not in complete sentences and it misses, you know, the ands and the thes and those kind of things. There's no punctuation. It's the raw Pittman. And so I've had to go through and sort of make those sentences out of it. And, and it can be really, um, really difficult. Um, so now I forgot where I was going. Someone remind me what the rest of the question was. In our, just in, in how, uh, how our so understanding has changed. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. So there's a whole section on interracial uh, mixing in that in that speech. Um, that's why I brought the speech up. It's got a horrible section of interracial mixing. Um, but Joseph Smith also against race mixing. Um, this is a part of the broader American context that I see that they just I, it would be um, I think it would be sort of really remarkable if if that didn't exist, because almost every state in the nation has laws against race mixing. Um, and I think you can follow that thread all the way through. Um, fear of race mixing is, is animating a lot of what's going on um, with the racial restrictions. And it transitions. Um, and I know that Matt Harris in his new book will, will deal with President Kimball. Um, but um, I include in my book, uh, President Kimball uh, interviews uh, the first black sister missionary after she returns and she starts dating a white man and she's getting pushed back from, you know, fellow Latter-day Saints. And she actually gets an interview with President Kimball. And, you know, we have sort of the, the, the sense of what happens there. And, and he says, look, it's not a sin. He breaks down and cries. He gives her a hug. Uh, she, um, you know, he says, you know, bless you and, 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 and your relationship and, and, um, I think that's why the race in the priesthood essay is so important because it includes that as a line, right? That um, interracial mixing is not a sin. Um, the language about it starts to soften by church leaders. I think they're brought up. They start to talk about the difficulties that you know cultural differences can present to marriages. You know that sort of starts to replace the old, really strident um, speaking out against. Um, race mixing as, as a sin. Um, uh, let's see, Peterson uh, gives a really terrible um, speech at BYU in 1954 after Brown versus Board of Education. And he argued, he basically says, well, this is just going to facilitate race mixing, including um, interracial mixing uh, marriages um, and really argues for segregation. Um, it's, so it's, it's entrenched for a very long time um, and clearly, uh, there is no uh, prescription against it. Uh, I mean, we know how it plays out legally in the United States. Um, Loving versus Virginia, Supreme Court strikes it down in 1967. Utah um, uh, did away with its anti miscegenation law in, in 1963, so four years ahead of uh, Loving versus Virginia. Um, so, yes, all the way through, there are. Uh, fears of race mixing, and they start to dissipate um, around the same time. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're going to let um, black people in the into the temple, and and you're going to um, there's no way that you're going to prevent this. And I think they recognize that. Um, the earliest, um, I, so here's the other interesting thing to keep in mind: Utah never has a law against Native American um, white race mixing, and uh, the earliest interracial ceiling takes place um, between a Native American and a white person. Um, Charles Dana is a Native American convert, and he marries a white woman in Nauvoo, and they are sealed in Nauvoo. And, and the leaders acknowledge this as a good thing, because that's the way that you bring Native peoples uh, along towards white and delights them, is through intermarriage. And Brigham Young encourages missionaries preaching uh, amongst Native Americans in Utah Territory to take plural wives amongst Native Americans. Um, so you're going to bring them uh, in your journey towards whiteness with you. You're going to leave Black people behind because it brings a curse on you. That's the way that it plays out differently with those two racial groups. And I deal with that in, in Religion of a Different Color. There are a couple of chapters on red, white, and Mormon, and then four chapters on Black, white, and Mormon. And they play out differently for those two racial groups. The, the desired outcome is whiteness. Once again, I, I'm talking about the power of whiteness in this racial history. Um, Native Americans intermarry amongst them, lighten them and make them white and delight them. Black people intermarry amongst them, it brings a curse upon you, right? And then your descendants won't be eligible for the priesthood. So those are the ways it plays out. 
and and it doesn't and it doesn't go away. For those of you who saw the video from Brother Martin at BYU Hawaii this time last year, he shares a story. I don't know if it was in the '80s or '90s, but a BYU professor told him that it was still a sin that he was married to a white woman. So um, these these ideas don't die quickly. Um, I think we're we're running low on this. I, there's um, what from your background has made you passionate about this topic in particular? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, um, I guess for me, uh, the, la the existing explanations for the Latter-day Saint racial story um, it didn't make sense uh, when I started research for for my book, Religion of a Different Color. Um, I had read a lot of whiteness studies that existed in the historiography. These were largely uh, immigrant immigrant and labor stories. So Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants weren't accepted as white, um, were racialized as not white enough um, through their labor and, and immigration stories. They had to, um, you know, earn whiteness and um, my research in the Latter-day Saint tradition, um, I had noticed that this was going on, but for me, it wasn't a labor and immigration story. It was a religious story. This is a quintessential insider-born religion, but converting to Mormonism somehow makes you racially suspect. Um, I, I just um, was curious uh, how Latter-day Saints fit into that whiteness kind of um, historiography, and that's what prompted the research. Um, for my own sort of, so so that's an academic project. I'm at a research one institution, we have to publish or perish. Um, and I was looking for a new project. I felt like there was, might be something there. Um, I talked to colleagues and they said, oh, you get a nice journal article out of that, but certainly not a book. And, you know, once I started the research, the evidence was just uh, overwhelming. It just sort of uh, an avalanche. Um, so, that's the academic part of it. The, the personal part of it was um, hoping to uh, try to understand the racial priesthood and temple restrictions because the explanations that existed at the time did not make sense to me. Um, I guess um, I, um, it, it didn't match with my understanding of a loving God, um, what I read in the scriptures, um, you know, um, I don't know how someone like Brigham Young could read Second Nephi chapter 26, the entire chapter, we like to quote verse 33, right? Like all are alike unto God, but read the whole chapter, right? Um, is anyone barred? And the constant answer is no. Um, is anyone prevented from salvation? Is anyone not welcome? That whole chapter, I don't know. Uh, it, it just didn't add up to me. Um, I had a member of my congregation um, who, after the book came out, uh, read it and, and came to me and, and said, she had tears in her eyes. This is an older, older woman. She said, I've struggled with this my entire life. Thank you for not making me believe in a racist God. That's what it boiled down to her, for, for, for her. And I, I guess for me, those were the kind of sticking points as well. And so, um, uh, I, uh, I, the answers weren't satisfactory to me and, um, the way that we, we continue to justify, um, the racial restrictions were not satisfactory to me. They, they, those, those justifications felt still kind of, uh, you know, drenched in racism. And so it became a passion of mine, um, as a result, uh, because I believe, I, I guess, um, as a believer, uh, that we have something to offer the world in terms of um, loving heavenly parents who love all of their children equally. That's a pretty profound doctrine in my estimation um, that is beautiful and it somehow got lost. Um, I, I don't know if that's a great explanation. I haven't thought, <laughs> thought it through enough. It just became a passion of mine um, uh, that, that felt compelling to me. Um, I mean, I'll share. Well, I don't know. Um, I'll I do share have one. Oh, go go for it, brother. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, just just one last thought on that. Um, um, you know, after some of this scholarship came out, um, I had this is a unique interaction with with uh, an apostle who shook my hand, looked me in the eye, 
said, thank you for your scholarship on this topic. Please continue to study this topic. We need all the help we can get. So I thought after the book, you know, um, it would be done, but, um, uh, you know, the Century of Black Mormons project is, is um, most of the scholarship has uh, attempted to look at this from the perspective of, um, you know, the leaders, the white leaders and the decisions that they made. It's much more difficult to try to understand it from Black Latter-day Saints who joined the faith, and uh, no one's ever even attempted to name and, and identify them. How is our story complete if we don't include the entire body of Christ? If we don't even know their names, how do we include them in, in our story? Uh, and so the database is a collection of biographies uh, where we write biographies for each individual that we can identify, um, baptized between 1830 and 1930. By the time we're done, we'll be somewhere between three and 400. Um, many more than the one or two that might people might have in, in mind. And, and we're learning um, a significant amount of information as a result of that research that also will complicate the racial story because a lot of people slipped past the walls of exclusion. Um, race is not something you can easily identify. We have um, the first, we've identified and documented um, a former enslaved woman who is a seal to her husband in 1863 in Salt Lake. Her father was her enslaver, so she's a mixed racial ancestry, and this happens in the plantation south. Um, she converts to the church in Ohio, maybe as a runaway slave, and, and she meets um, Nathan Meads, who was a convert from uh, England, um, and uh, they immigrate to the Great Basin, and they're still together in 1863. She receives full temple rituals. Um, she is apparently light enough to pass as white, but we have evidence that her stake leaders at least at some point became aware of her mixed racial ancestry, but allowed her um, temples and, and everything uh, to stand. So um, that's just a, a one example of many in our database where um, these, these racial walls of exclusion, especially we know now with DNA, it's just impossible to police racial boundaries. Brother Reeve, we really, really appreciate your your time, your your efforts to to research your uh, your scholarship, and then and, mo and mostly your discipleship. We really appreciate the way that you've framed this issue and giving uh, giving us uh, a perspective. Um, it has been amazing to be with you this morning. Um, with that being said, everybody who's on here, we we've we've recorded this. Um, Brother Reeve, you're, you're willing to share your PowerPoint? Yeah? Yeah, sure, sure. I'm happy to pass it on. Okay, so we'll, we'll make that available to you all. Um, and uh, at this point, we'll kind of close and just let you get to the rest of your meetings. And again, thank you very much, Brother Reeve. We, we love you and we appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. It's a, been a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for all you're doing. Guys, thank enjoy you so your much. day.